As I said, you never know what's going to happen next. One microphone goes out. Some of you are saying, boy, I hope that man right there, his microphone goes out. Maybe we can get out early. <laughs> All right, that's not funny up there. <laughs> I should have known. I should have known. All right. <laughs> First John chapter 2, verse John. Actually, help me out there. I got to thinking, sitting over there, I mean, this, it's already hard enough to be a, a preacher on a rainy Sunday morning. I mean, when it's raining outside, everybody's got droopies, tripping over your lower lip, all that. And then you come in here and just, you just got one screen. <laughs> like that matters. Then I'm standing over there, and everybody's looking at me because they're looking at that screen. So, uh, so I, uh, I got to thinking. I said, man, we need to do something here. And, and uh, so thank you for turning my microphone off. Just don't do it anymore, all right? <laughs> First John chapter 2, let's stand together, please. First John chapter 2. And I really, really, to be honest with you, I, I just really need your attention. I'm going to stay pretty close to my notes today because... I can't, I really can't believe the section of scripture that God has brought us to today. I, uh, we started First uh, John, and I think this is, this is part six of a sermon series entitled Beloved, how God's people are, are beloved of God, and John used that because he felt like he was the beloved disciple, and the subtitle of our series, How the Love of Christ Can Revolutionize Our Love for Him, How We Understand He First Loved Us. And when we get that down, how we can love him more because we're headed for home. We're headed for glory someday, someday soon. And of all places we land today, and you're not going to get it till I get in the middle of this message, maybe as we read through it, but this is amazing to me. And uh, so I really need you to, to stick with me. The introduction's long. Look at verse number 18, 1 John chapter 2. Little children, it is the last time. Hmm. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. By the way, how many believe Jesus Christ is coming again? Yeah. And just as much as we believe that, Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist. <clears throat> that denieth the Father and the Son. Whoso denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the, the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye, shall, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you all of all things, and is truth and is no lie, even as it hath taught you, that is that anointing, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in me, that... When, excuse me, abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Folks, this doesn't take rocket science. I'm going to speak on this subject for just a while this morning, the anointing of the beloved I'll draw your attention to two verses, verse 20. Let's read verse 20 and 27 out loud together. Verse 20 in unison, ready? But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Verse 27, ready? 
But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Father, bless your word. Teach us, Lord, please. Capture our attention, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Like dominoes, the human control of this world is collapsing. The Bible said it would be so. Almost daily, our nation is becoming more and more viciously divided. The confusion and uncertainty is literally petrifying most of those around us in our families and in our community. Right now, there are two major emotions that are encompassing our nation and sadly, even the church. Here they are, fear and anger. I dare say that there are many in this auditorium this morning that have felt both of these emotions the past few weeks. The emotion of fear, the emotion of anger. However, there is another attitude that can conquer these two emotions. That attitude is this, knowledge, truth. You see, the end result of both fear and anger is confusion and defeat. And let me just say this, if you remain in a state of fear, you will be defeated. If you remain in a spirit of anger, and there's a time for anger, I suppose, and there's a time for fear, I suppose. I hate snakes. If I see a snake, the first thing I do is fear, and the second thing I have is anger, and I, I kill it. And I suppose there's a time and a place for all those things, but if you remain in the, in the uh, state uh, of fear, you're going to be defeated. But with truth comes knowledge, and with knowledge comes confidence and power. Now think about that. Chew on that. Today, Christians are living in an hour of crises, and they must learn how to guard against the lies of the enemy. God has always given his people the ability to find truth. For Jesus said in John 8, 32, it is the truth that sets us free. It is the truth that gives us confidence. In Genesis chapter 18, verse 17, when God was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, God said this to the two angels that would oversee the destruction. And I'm quoting here. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation? And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. The point is that God has always informed his people of what he was about to do. In fact, that's throughout Scripture. Psalm 25, 14, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Amos chapter 3 and verse 7, Sure the Lord will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Even our Lord Jesus Christ said this in John 15, 15, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Now the idea with Abraham is this. God told those two angels that were going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, I'm not going to hide this from Abraham because Abraham, here's what validated this knowledge. Abraham is going to do what I've asked him to do in his life and with his family. I understand this. I believe that every born-again Christian that has the Spirit of God can understand a little bit about what's going on. God uses his word in the indwelling of the Spirit to reveal truth to his children. John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. John 16, 13. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak and he shall show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. How many believe the truth is out there? 
Sure it is. And I got to think about all this this week, and God, of course, led us to this section of Scripture this morning. When you got saved, the Holy Spirit came into your life, and he indwells you this very moment. If you're truly born again, the third person of the Trinity lives in you and seals you under the day of redemption. The Bible says in verse 27, he abideth in you. The Holy Spirit has the knowledge of all things that God wants us to know. And through God's word, this knowledge is imparted to all believers if you'll pick it up and read it and you have a desire to obey what God says and the Spirit of God fills your life. <clears throat> this is called the anointing. Now, for the sake of sounding like a charismatic preacher, which I basically believe pretty much nothing they believe, I will tell you this. That God knows everything, which means the Holy Spirit knows everything, which means if he lives inside of you, he has the ability to show you what God wants you to know. Now you're saying, like well, so he's going to show me everything. No, he's not going to show you everything, because if he'd show you everything, he'd scare the willies out of you. Just like the apostle Paul was caught up in the third heaven, he was only allowed to come back and down and say certain things, because there's a lot of it we wouldn't understand. And so he lives inside of us. With this anointing comes a great understanding and the confidence that we need to live peaceful and unashamed in the world that God has allowed us to live in. Now, let me just ask you right now before I get into my notes. How in the world did they make it in Jesus' day and in Paul's day in the Roman Empire under all that severe persecution and Christians dying every day? How in the world did they make it if they didn't have some confidence, if they didn't have some peace in their life? Where in the world did they come from? That came from the knowledge of the Scriptures as revealed by the Holy Spirit of God. That's called the anointing. I have three points. Number one, for those of you on this side that can see my point, there it is, the demanding for God's anointing. If you're on this side, that's what that says. The demand... For God's anointing. Look at verse number 18. Immediately John reveals a great need for those who walk in the light of this present dark world. He says, these are the last days. The last days we understand in scripture are dark days. The last days are perilous times. The last days shall escalate and intensify in its, uh, in its perils in that it shall wax worse and worse. That is a process. So you and I can expect all those things. And so then we come to a term antichrist and antichrist plural. This means three things. Number one, when the Bible speaks of antichrist, and pretty much that's contained with the teachings of the apostle John himself in this book and the book of Revelation. So he speaks and reveals the term antichrist to us. And uh, antichrist himself is Satan's superman that will lead this earth in a final rebellion against God's son. Then secondly, it also means false teachers or antichrist, those which are anti to Christ, those which ad adhere completely to this world system that opposes Christ and all he has. Now let me just say this. That is very, very prevalent right now in our society. This world is not a bit afraid of Jesus Christ. And they are resisting him on many fronts right now. Those are those who teach false things about Christ. And then thirdly, John will talk about this later in his book, and that is the spirit of Antichrist. So you got Antichrist, those who teach Antichrist philosophy, and then you have a pervading spirit of Antichrist, which again is the intensifying attitudes of evil in this world that opposes all that is godly. And let me stop and say this. If you feel more opposed as a Christian than you ever have before, there's a reason for that. Evil is on a rampage now, and the demand for God's anointing of truth is vital for your spiritual survival. The last thing we need 
in a time when we need revival is God's people who know nothing about the Word of God, do not understand the Spirit of God, how He works in revealing Himself in the Word of God, and just throwing up their hands, running in the woods like a crazy person saying, I give up, I give up. Because that's exactly what Satan wants, and that's exactly what this world system wants. Churches last thing stand in their way. Where was I? So now we have the Antichrist who will soon be revealed. Then there are many Antichrists even now. Then he uses this phrase twice in this section. He says, you're but little children. Why does he say that? I know you think you're high and mighty and you think you got this whole thing, this whole thing figured out. And by the way, if you do come and see me because I don't, I do have Christ figured out. And I do know that Jesus Christ is coming again. And I don't know that I can put all the dots together before he comes back, but I can tell you this, if you'll read your Bible, you'll connect more dots than you think. He calls us little children because it's almost like we're caught in the crosshairs of a battle between good and evil. Surely God would not leave his children to walk in this pagan world without some kind of guidance and protection. And let me just say, ladies and gentlemen, he doesn't. You've got the Bible, and you need to learn to tear this thing apart with the help of prayer and the Spirit of God like you never have. May God help us with that. So we've got this this demand. He shows us this need. Little children, this is coming on you. He was teaching this in John's day. Number two, write this one down, the discovery of the unanointed. Okay, how do we know who these antichrist plural are and by the way if you're looking for the antichrist uh, you know I, I don't think I waste a lot of time on that me personally because I don't think we're going to know who that feller is until we're out of here because I'm not setting under his rule I'm going to be with Jesus Christ in the rapture and so we should be studying Christ's return It is coming, the Bible says in verse 28. And so, we have this demand. So, if the Antichrists are out there, what about the discovery of these unanointed? If we're anointed, we're supposed to be able to see through this with discernment. What's some signs here, right? Those anti to Christ are identified in these verses. Verse 19, for instance, says this. It says that they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if, they had not, if, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out uh, that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. So we have number one, one clue here of this discovery. Number one, they depart from the fellowship of truth. We could say they depart from the, the church, but all churches don't teach truth. For instance, I saw a headline this morning that the United Methodist Church in America just uh, had 100, 100 of their ministers come out uh, as LBGTQXYZ. Like that's, that's, the, that's a church that teaches truth. And by the way, that just went out online right there, and I really realized that, and, which is why YouTube's taking down some of our messages right now. But you're out there thinking, no, that don't ever happen. So they depart from the fellowship of truth, or you could say the church, verse 19. These are people that may be a member of a local church, but they're not part of the true spiritual body of Christ. They're pretenders, you might say. This is why a church should be based on the truth of the Word of God and not the truth of man. Because watch this now. The Word of God... Truth always exposes a lie. That's why it's called the light. Click the light on. Just see, was that a cockroach I saw run across the floor? Turn the light on. See that snake in the grass. Turn the light on and see the eyes of that wolf. And truth is revealed through the word of God. Number one, they depart from the fellowship of the truth. Number two, they lie about knowing Christ, verse 22. They lie about knowing Christ. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is, he is an antichrist, not the antichrist, but anti to Christ that denieth the Father and the Son. Whoso denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. And so they lie about knowing Christ. There is a play on words here 
in verse number 22 where it says Jesus is the Christ. It doesn't say Jesus Christ, which it typically says. It says, phrase it, Jesus is the Christ, making a dynamic statement that Jesus is Messiah. The word Jesus means Savior and emphasizes Christ's humanity or uh, he, he, says, he says who he is and what he does. He saves people. He's the Savior. The word Christ means Messiah or the anointed one, that he is God's son, the eternal sent one, emphasizing his deity. <clears throat> By the way, that's where the Pharisees and the Sadducees kind of got off the boat with him. That's where a lot of people get off. Well, you know, I believe in this Jesus thing. We have, we have back in the 70s Jesus people. Well, they wouldn't have believed that Jesus is God by their psychedelic philosophies, if some of you old hippies know what I'm talking about. And so uh, many will acknowledge the historical Jesus, but they admit, and they admit that he lived in this world and was a great teacher. They may even participate in religious activities like Christmas, Easter, tithing, even the communion service, and they may even be baptized in order to feel as though that they are cooperating with their religion. But ladies and gentlemen, if you do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he is God, they died on the cross for your sins. He was buried three days, and he rose again. He's alive right now. If we don't believe that, we're not Christians. Now, I understand there's some progression to that. I, I don't know as a little boy when I got saved that I, I knew that Jesus had, had a, I knew he was in heaven, but I didn't know where at heaven, in heaven. But I believe that Jesus died for me. And I believe he was the son of God resurrected. One day, George Whitfield, the old British evangelist, was speaking to a man about his soul. And he asked, he said, sir, are you a believer? To which the man said, I believe what my church believes. Whitfield said, and what does your church believe? The man said, my church believes the same thing I believe. Whitfield said, well, what do both of you believe? The man said, well, we both believe the same thing. We laugh about that, and I did when I read it, but you'd be surprised at how many people sit in these pews week after week and have no idea what this church believes. By the way, what this church believes, our church creed and membership to that creed doesn't mean you're going to heaven. You've got to have a personal experience with Jesus Christ by being born again. And that's what John's teaching here. And so they depart from the fellowship of truth. They don't want to hear truth. Truth exposes. They lie about knowing Christ. And, and then uh, number three, they, how, do you, how do you discover these unanointed? They attempt to seduce and deceive the faithful. Now, this, is where, this is where the sheepdog comes in. This is where the shepherd rolls in. Verse 26 these things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. In other words, deceive you. Those that, those that get found out, those that exposed, are exposed by the truth, they can either go somewhere else and do their dastardly deed or they can stay among you and cause trouble among you. And they use the old idea that Satan used with Eve. Yea, hath God said... The Bible talks about that in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. That in the latter times some shall depart, depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. This is not the time to go off on this subject right now, but apostasy in America and most likely in the world is full-blown right now. And folks are falling away left and right. And you and I should have some type of tool, some type of spiritual ability to see through all that mess. I've got some good news. We do. Number three, jot this one down, the discernment of the anointed. The discernment of the anointed. This is the last point, and I'm finished. The idea of being anointed is an Old Testament practice of the pouring of oil on the head of a person that's being set apart for special service such as the priest in Exodus 28, 41, the king in 1 Samuel 15, 1, the prophet in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 16, is a sweet and beautiful, beautiful ceremony that revealed a decision on earth that had already been determined and sealed in heaven by God Almighty. As we move this idea of the anointing on to the New Testament believer, because we too are priests, a New Testament believer is anointed not with actual oil, 
but with the precious Holy Spirit of God. When he came in your life, you got all of the Holy Spirit you're going to get. And he never leaves you. He seals you. How much of that Holy Spirit power that you use in your life is up to you. You can shove him over in a corner or he can fill you and you can blossom as a Christian and you can understand the word of God like others don't understand. But every person under the sound of my voice has that same ability. First Peter chapter 2 verse 9. But you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out, out of darkness in his marvelous light. I believe with all of my heart, if my old grandpa Turner could sit there and watch the old Huntley Brinkley news about how bad it's going to be, and he turned around and looked at me and said, Mikey, I believe Jesus Christ is going to come back before I die. If my grandpa never saw a day of Bible college, didn't know anything about that, could take his Bible and read his Bible and devour his Bible like I watched that man of God do as a little boy growing up, I believe with all of my heart that there's not a person under the sound of my voice that can't take the Bible and do the same thing. I'm not talking about being a preacher. I'm talking about the men of the house and the women of the house being able to take that Bible and teach their children what God says and that Jesus Christ is coming and how to be saved and how to do right according to the Scriptures and how to marry right and how to walk right and how to live right. I believe we can all learn that right there. And it's the Spirit of God. That's the anointing that God gives every born-again believer. And how are we going to make it through these times? With this anointing, this unction comes the knowledge of God that brings us the power for living, the power for victory and confidence in this life. Just a quick review, verse 20, this anointing allows us to know all things. Let me validate that again. There's a lot of things I don't know about the Bible and about God. But I know a whole lot more now than I knew when I first got saved. And I know right now what God wants me to know, and I believe I'll know the rest of it when God wants me to know it, if I stay on the right track. Does that make sense? I was just teaching the new members class this morning. I said this. I said, when I got saved as a little boy, there was just a whole lot I didn't know, but I was privileged to live in a house where my mom and dad we had family devotions. I was privileged to go to a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church from the preacher right on down to Sunday school. We were taught the same doctrine. And it was a privilege for me to have all that. And that's what I want here in this church. I don't want somebody over in some other class teaching something that's not taught from this pulpit. And what's taught from this pulpit is what we say in our Constitution we believe. And I got to thinking about how that progressed for me whenever... I got married and had my own house. I just felt like, man, this is, I just need to know more about God. I can't rely on my mom and dad and taking me to church. I got to do this. And I remember we built our first house. You've heard me tell this story how we had three bedrooms. I took one bedroom. I designated that as my study. I wasn't a preacher. I was working a secular job, but I started getting books and a concordance and a Matthew Henry commentary set. I just started studying there in that little and I listened to the radio, I had a big stereo back there, and I listened to preachers in the evening, you know, preach and different things, and I just got interested in that, and I began to grow. And then I started teaching a class and started working with young people, and I just needed to know more. I started studying more. My wife was making the same progress right along with me. Then, lo and behold, God called me to preach, and boy, now I really stand out there in high water, and I needed need to learn more, and I, I learned more. Then I went to Bible college, and I learned more. Oh, well, this is all I'm going to need right here, but I learned more. Then I took my first church and found out everything I learned in Bible college. The doctrine was right, but they didn't tell me a hoot about anything else I needed to know. So I had to learn more. Then I came to this church, and I had to learn more. But I'll tell you this right now, and this is what I told our new members class this morning. In the last two years, I have watched God work, and I have learned more about God than I have never, ever known in those previous years and you can call it whatever you want to call it, but I'm telling you right now, God will show you all things with the Spirit of God if you'll stay on that course. Verse 21 says you can know the truth. So all these lies out there, preacher, you even said just cut the news off. I said cut the news off. And I, if you don't cut it off, that's up to you. 
but I've never heard so much lies in all my life. Bare face lies. Go ahead and listen to it. But I'll tell you this. I'd rather watch Bozo the Clown on some of this evening news. At least Bozo knows he's a fake. And I'll just say that if you'll follow the prescription given here in what is called the anointing or the unction, if you'll, if you'll follow God and stay in the Word of God and ask Him for His fullness and spiritual discernment, He'll show you the truth. Oh, yeah. And right now, if you knew some of the truth that's out there and it hits you up the side of the head, it, you'd think, well, where, where have I been the past couple of years? Number three, uh, verse 21, last part, we can discern lies. We can discern lies. Verse 27, last part, we can, we, we, it teaches us how we can abide in him and stay close to him in his presence. Verse 28, this anointing, we can, we can live our lives with confidence knowing that, that uh, we're making good decisions with God's help. Verse 28 teaches us how, how not to be ashamed when we, when we meet him. Verse 29 teaches us to discern who is, it, it will teach us how to discern who's truly living righteously. Let me just say, everything that quacks is not a duck, and every politician that says he's saved is not necessarily saved. Or every Hollywood person or singer or whatever. Because there is something called righteous living. I'm just saying that God did not leave us without the truth. He did not leave us without someone to guide us in truth. That person that guides us in truth is the Holy Spirit of God. He remains behind the scenes, but he's there if we ask him to help us. There's a certain chiding, if I could call it that, found in verse 21. I want you to look at it with me. He's writing a book by inspiration, but he says this in verse 21. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. He wrote this book as a record. The people that were supposed to, to suppose, they already knew the truth. They were supposed to be acting on the truth. God did not allow John to write because they were not able to know the truth. We already know it because we have the anointing of the Spirit of God. We're taught to compare Scripture with Scripture, for instance, God does not come right out and tell you who the Antichrist is. But he sure does use the word of God and the spirit of God within us to tell us that his seven years of reign is close. I'm going to say something that I hope that you'll consider. Something's in the air right now. I say something because I don't know that I can put legs to it. Things on this earth are extremely different. I know it, and you know it. I know you know. If you're reading the Bible. And there are some in this room that have done very little about the fact that the Spirit of God is prodding you to set your life in order before he comes back. I mean that in two ways. Number one, this book was written to Christians. And it's all about God showing you how much he loves you so that you'll love him back the way you should while you have time to do that before you go to heaven. You say, well, you sure got away from that today. No, no, no. God shows you he loves you by giving you his word and giving you his Holy Spirit as a gift to guide you into truth. If you didn't have that today, you, you'd be bonkers. And I want you to consider this today. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you, you're saved. And I will tell you this, he's always working on Christians first to get their lives right. Is everything right between you and God? 
right now, the things that you're involved in in life, God's pleased with all of that because we're going to stand before him someday. I say it secondly for this reason. If you're not a born-again Christian, the Holy Spirit continues to work, but in a different way. The Holy Spirit comes to you saying, you need Jesus. You need to be born again. You've never taken care of that. And he's working in your life right now. And I don't know when Christ is coming back, but I'll tell you this. I would be a very, very fearful person to fall in the hands of an angry God, a wrathful God, if I knew that there was something I could fix before I saw him face to face. Stand together, please, with our heads bowed, our eyes are closed. I ask you three times today, how many believe Jesus Christ has come again? All three times, a good hearty amen. And I, I do believe that you believe that. Well, just as much as he's coming back, the scriptures gave us some advice today that we need to follow. I wonder how many say this preacher today, more than ever before, I realize I need the guidance of the Spirit of God in my life. Would you put your hand up? I need that anointing. I need that anointing. God bless you. Many hands raised. That is available to you right now. Would you pray and ask God to start showing you some light in Scripture? And it may be today that you've not been in the Word of God in weeks or months. Would you start today, tomorrow, getting in the Word of God, asking God for help? They're going to play softly right here. And many of you lift your hands and Jesus Christ could come back today. I want to give you a chance to come and just kind of clear the air with the Lord. Maybe with a loved one. Folks who are coming now, you might want to join these today. Would you consider this? I know you know there's something going on. Things are not the same. If God wanted them to be the same, he'd make them the same. But they're not the same. Maybe today you just need to come and ask God for some help there, some clarity. Many of you are saved. You know you're saved. And I'm so thankful for that. But it could be you're not sure that you're a born-again Christian. We're going to have somebody standing at the end of each aisle with a Bible in their hand. They'll take that Bible today and show you how you can know for sure that you're going to heaven. We want you to come today. If you've been saved, I've been baptized. We want to help you with all that. If you'd like to join our church, we'd love to have you come right here. These men will help you as you come. This altar is open as folks begin to move. Let's find ourselves a place today, maybe in your seat. Let's ask God to pour it out on us today. Father, bless this invitation time. Speak to hearts today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're singing right now. You come and you do that.